Good morning to everyone and welcome back to another edition of the Whispering Hope Adult Lesson Study Review here for today, Monday, 2nd October. And what a delight it is to be here with you today uh, because we're in a new quarter and this quarter we are studying God's mission, my mission. And this week our topic is God's mission to us, part one. However, today our topic for discussion is entitled the God who longs to be with us. And here with me today, Anik Adams, is our usual Monday guest. And these are in the persons of Elder Vaughn Joseph and Elder Stacy Maskell. Good morning, gentlemen and lady. Welcome to Whispering Hope. Good morning. I was waiting for the lady to go first, but I'll go. And welcome to everyone who's viewing. Once again, we're grateful that you stayed with us for the final quarter in the year. And uh, Sister Anik, I'm happy to be here on Whispering Hope, continuing the work of spreading the gospel. So I pray that as we go through today's study, that myself, you and Sister Stacy will all be able to be glad and be joyful in the work of the Lord this morning. Yes, Sister Anik, it's indeed a privilege for us to be here once again, because indeed God has blessed us with life for us to be here this morning on this platform. And I just want to say good morning to Elder Vaughn and yourself and to all those who are listening this morning. Amen. Thank you for that greeting and good morning back right back at you. Welcome to Whispering Hope to those who are studying with us this morning, Monday. We are happy that you decided to join with us this morning to help to start, set your morning tone and set your week right. Now, before we begin, I'm going to ask Elder Stacy to pray for us. And then Elder Vaughn will read our memory text for the week and share with us any further uh, insights that he would have gleaned that can help to situate the discussion for this morning. Most kind eternal Father, we're indeed happy that we can be here once again, dear Lord, to review your word. Dear Lord, you know we need to hide that this word in our hearts so that we will not sin against thee. So I pray, dear Lord, that we may find that opportunity this morning as we explore, as we study, so that we can be closer drawn with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The memory text comes from... Genesis chapter 3, verse 9, and I'm reading from the New King James Version. It says, Then the Lord God called Adam and said to him, Where are you? Now, Sister Anik, it's a very short memory text, very short passage of scripture, but it speaks volume to the question itself as to who God is and who we are supposed to be in his sight. Because here it is that we have the God of creation, the omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent God, is asking his creation, Adam, where are you? Now, I don't think for one minute that God was, Adam was playing hide and seek with God. Maybe he was playing hide and seek, but God is omniscient. God knew exactly where he was, and it wasn't a place of it wasn't a case of the physical location of Adam, but he wanted Adam to understand after what he would have done, the position or the state that he's in. And so this is a rhetorical question. Not for Adam to put up his hand behind the leaf and say, oh, I'm over here. It's a case where he wanted Adam to think, where are you in your relationship to me? That is what I think the, the memory text is talking about. And as we look at this week's lesson and today's lesson in particular, we will get an understanding as to where the quarter of this week's lesson is going in terms of being a missionary for God and how God has done all that he has done to save us. Amen. What a powerful insight that the question that God would have asked Adam transcends time because God is even asking us this same question every day. Where are you, Anik, in your relationship with me? Where are you, Vaughn? Where are you, Stacy? And so it's a question, it's a pointed question that we need to reflect on every minute of the day because at the end of the day, our entire lifestyles are supposed to be a uh, witness to who God is and his character, his love and everything. And so if at any point that we realize that we are behaving in a way or acting in a way or speaking in a way contrary to God, we have to then make the changes and allow his spirit to make the changes in us. All right. So... We are studying the God who longs to be with us. Now, yesterday, uh, the discussion would have uh, surrounded the topic, the God who reaches out to us. 
And of course, those on the platform yesterday would have dealt with the whole the fall and the whole uh, fact that sin came into the world after Adam and Eve because of their choice, their freedom of choice, would have chosen to walk in a particular direction, even though it was contrary to God's will. And of course, we would have been told about um, the revelation of the, 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 the plan, the mission of salvation. So today now we're looking at the fact that God has always longed to be with us. And today we want to look at the Old Testament first. Now in the Old Testament, we see evidence of God executing his missionary nature in order to, to fulfill his purposes. I'm going to ask Elder Vaughan for you to read Genesis chapter 17, verse 7, and Elder Stacy Genesis 26, verse 3. And I will read Genesis 28, 15. And the question is, what was the main focus of God's promise to Abraham and his descendants in these verses? What was the main focus of God's promise to Abraham and his descendants in these verses? I'll begin with uh, Genesis chapter 17 and verse 7, reading from the King James Version. It says, And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee in their generations, for an everlasting covenant, to be a God unto thee, and to thy seed after thee. And reading similarly from the King James Version, in Genesis 26 verse 3, Sojourn in this land, and I will be with thee, and will bless thee. For unto thee and unto thy seed I will give all these countries, and I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father. Genesis chapter 28 verse 15 reads, And behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all places, whither thou goest and will bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. So, Elder Vaughan, what was the main focus of God's promise to Abraham and his descendants in these verses? God here speaking to Abraham initially in Genesis chapter 17, verse 7. Remember, Abraham was told to leave his, his home and his is his family and, and to go into a place where he basically, I didn't know where he was going, but he knew who sent him and who called him. And so he trusted God. Well, God made a promise to him. And he says initially in Genesis 17, verse 7, that he will establish his covenant between him and I seed. And we see in Genesis 26, when he's speaking to the descendant of, of Abraham, he says that, and I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father. So we're looking here at the continuation of generations from Abraham downwards. Now, it's interesting because we can get into some deep theology here in that, is it just the biological lineage of Abraham that is going to be blessed, that God is going to have a, have a covenant with? And so if I wasn't born from the family out of the lineage of Abraham from the Middle East somewhere, then me, a uh, descendant of Africans from whichever lineage, then I would not be able to have a covenant with God. God would not establish a covenant with me. Well, certainly not, because we understand here, God is making a promise to Abraham. And as the word of God says in the New Testament, it says those who are of Abraham's faith is of Abraham's seed. And so all of us who have the faith in Jesus Christ, like Abraham did when he left his household, when he went out into a place of which he knew not, but he trusted God. When we put our trust and faith in God, like Abraham did, then we are grafted in, into the covenant of God. Because the covenant of God is not for some people and, for, and not for others. It's for all of us. As long as we accept who Christ is that he came and he died for our sins. So when we accept Christ, then we can be a part of that covenant because those who reject Christ, those who refuse to believe that Christ even exists or accept him as their Lord and Savior, that covenant cannot, they cannot be a part of that covenant. That covenant that God is going to do what he says he's going to do, that he's going to die for our sins, that he's going to save us from our sins. And so these verses here, Sister Anik, they basically speak primarily about the covenant that God is establishing and by implication, it is for all of us, as long as we play our part and accept who Christ is. 
I think we can even talk more in the affirmative that as we studied last quarter of Ephesians and we were exposed to the fact that the Gentiles too have that right to be there, Sister Annie, to speak to this inheritance, this birthright, as Elder Vaughan would have said, it surpasses Abraham's promise and to Esau and to Isaac and all that he has promised Abraham immediate seed. But when God called Abraham, as we would have been basically reminded in this today's lesson, he wanted to single out a people who could stand for him, Sister Annie, a people who he could use as an example of how he wants to work through us, how he's really running after us, Sister Annie, based on the memory text. Because the fact that God has taken time to ask Adam where he is, is showing that God was searching for Adam, Sister Anik. And so in the situation with Abraham, similarly, he went and sought out Abraham and said, look, come from where you are and I'm going to give you this. And it's similar the same thing he wants to do for us, Sister Anik. He wants to set us apart as a people for him. He wants to give us the birthright. He wants to form a new covenant through the death of his son with us. And so, yes, we reflect on what the promises were in those texts to Abraham. But we send certainly applied to us, as Elder Vaughan would have alluded to, because it is relevant now, because there is a new covenant in Jesus Christ that he has established, and he wants to give us that inheritance that he's going to prepare for us, Sister Annie. And amen. I, I'm so happy that both of you brought out those um, solid points. First of all, that um, everything that God has promised to us is not only for those who um, in the past were directly related to Abraham, but it's for all of the descendants of Abraham and for those even of us who are Gentiles who are grafted in to the faith by the mere fact that we accepted Christ. So I love the all-inclusive nature of the gospel that Jesus came for all of us to show us who God is so that all of us could connect and form a relationship with each and every one of us. And as Sister Stacey, Elder Stacey said, um, also the fact that we are heirs um, to Christ's inheritance. And so we all have something to hope for and to look forward to. Now, in today's lesson, in the second paragraph, it begins, as history goes on, Joseph ends up in Egypt, but as an instrument of salvation to God's people. How is this possible, Elder Vaughan and then Elder Stacy, when he was sold into slavery? As an instrument of salvation to God's people? Well, there, the word, there it is referring to, I believe, Sister Anik, God's people, meaning those exactly that we spoke about earlier, about the descendants of Abraham. They we're talking about now the direct lineage in terms of those who uh, were born of out of Abraham's loins. And we have Jacob, or Israel, and he had 12 sons. And we know they had multiplied, and there are lots of lineage there and persons who were gone down into Egypt. Joseph was sold to Egypt in slavery, and he went there, although he could not see it at the time, to save his brothers who would have come to buy grain and to save also all of Egypt and all of those who live in Goshen and all of those who live in the surrounding areas who are in famine and, and all those sorts of things. Because the wisdom that God gave Joseph while he was wrongly accused and thrown in prison, while he was in prison itself and was forgotten by those who were in prison with him when they came out, all those things all those times, the word of God says clearly that God was with him. Now, we can't see that in our own lives. When things are going wrong, we're being sold into slavery, uh, cast in jail unjustly, forgotten there to rot in jail. We can't see that. But the Bible says that God was with him. God was with Joseph all the time. And, you know, he was very faithful to God. I, I don't remember him cursing God or anything, any recording of such thing. And here it is now that God's people were in need. And because Joseph would have followed the vision that God gave him and the, the wisdom that God gave him, he stored up all this amount of food when there was none in the land. And so he was able to give to those who were in need, including his family, his lineage, his, his father and, and all of those brothers and so on and all of his other relatives. He was able to give them, provide for them food, which was very necessary. But, you know, it was also more than just the physical food. There's also an object lesson that Christ gave to 
Joseph himself and also to those of his father and his other brothers and so on, that the love of God is beyond comprehension at times. It goes beyond what we human beings can ever think. The love of God that demonstrated how Joseph came around and loved his brothers and provided for them and all of them. That was just a marvelous story of how God set up everything, though we as human beings couldn't see it, but it was for their own good. Stanley, I'm just sitting here and I'm just wondering, you know, through the eyes of Joseph, through the eyes of the siblings, Sister Anique. Now, I am the eldest of three children for my mom. And I do have a, a younger sister. And if you see my sister, Sister Anique, we don't look anything alike. You know, she's fairer than me. She came with the nice here. She came with everything, Sister Anique. So imagine I'm Reuben and Judah and stuff like that. And you have Joseph being daddy's favorite. It's a story I like very much in the Bible. You know, I can say sometimes, especially when mommy's being partial, she's taking the side of the younger one who perhaps, you know, is a favorite. And, and I'm just amazed how they were able to get rid of Joseph and Joseph came right back in their lives, Sister Annie. You know, that is God's permissive nature. That is God having foresight. That is God looking beyond the, the, the realms that we can see, Sister Annie. And sometimes in life, when things hit us hard, we take it on, Sister Annie, and we don't understand that God is in control. We figure, mm -hmm. okay, this is it. I can't handle it. And so I can imagine perhaps Joseph on his journey was wondering, what, where did I go wrong, Lord? How did I end up being here? Even when Potiphar's wife would approach him and he'd say, I can't do this thing against my God. You know, even in, in the prison when he was able to stand up and speak for Christ, you know, that was his motivator. Because I'm sure deep down within, Joseph knew God was not going to bring me here and leave me. And so from the prison to the palace, Sister Annie, we know the story. We know the story. And we know as Elder Vaughn would have highlighted, he was able to save not only Egypt, <laughs> but the surrounding nations and even his own family. So I'm saying when God step into our lives, Sister Anik, you just let go and let God. Even if it takes you down to the roughest parts, allow him to play out his life and his purpose in you. Because he is doing it for his glory at the end of the day. And so this is just a word of encouragement for us as we reflect on Joseph and how God would have used him and never left his side. Amen. And this is such a powerful, powerful, powerful testimony. And Ellen G. White concurs with this point that the lesson study makes because she actually says that the Christian always has a strong helper in the Lord. Christ will never <laughs> fail those who put their trust in him. And so even if we make it into a, a, a pra make a practical application that, you know, sometimes we find ourselves in some really dire straits, really difficult situations, and we wonder, why would God allow this? Why would God permit this? But even in Joseph's situation in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, he says, but as for you, ye, ye thought evil against me but God meant it unto good. And so this is what he said to his siblings, you know, you really meant evil towards me, but God could see the bigger picture. And he knew that I, he put me in this position so that I could be an instrument to be used for his glory. And so all of us as Christians, even when we're in difficult situations, we need to seek to lift up Jesus and to represent him well, because I mean, the battle is not against flesh and blood. And so we're sometimes in a conflict and I'm guilty of it. And, we're thinking about the here and now, but the, the unseen agency is working against us. And if we could only see that Christ is ordering our steps so that we don't fall into the traps that the enemy set out for us, we would stop murmuring and complaining and give God praise and glory and thanks because that, that is what he expects of us, you know? So we need to just be encouraged this morning, listeners, and of course to my guests, that Christ is always with us. And so no matter where we are in our Christian experience, we just need to trust God a little bit more and allow him to use us for his glory because we are all missionaries. We are on the battlefield for him and we have to allow him to continue to equip us to be ministers for him. Now, when we go on, we are looking now at another Old Testament experience. I'm going to ask Elder Vaughan to read Exodus chapter 29, verses 43 and 45. 
Exodus 29, 43 and 45. And in this account, I would like for you to read it and answer the question, what was one of the main purposes of the Old Testament sanctuary? Because we know the sanctuary was built as a symbol of God's presence. And God is here longing to be with us. And he keeps showing himself that he wants to dwell among us. So what is really the sanctuary? What is What was the purpose of it? And how, how do we see God through the sanctuary pointing us to Jesus and his plan to save us? Exodus 29, verse 43 and 45, from the King James Version, it says, And there I will meet with the children of Israel, and the tabernacle shall be sanctified by my glory. And verse 45 says, And I will dwell among the children of Israel, and will be their God. Sister Anik, God's longing desire is to be with his people. He had it perfect in, in Eden. But then here comes in Eden that infraction where sin intervened. And ever since that infraction happened, man has been running from God. You see, remember, we text talk about God asking Adam, where are you? That is man running from God. Physically, spiritually, all other avenues running from God. And God has been giving chase to mankind. Running us all through from Genesis right down to Revelation. Running us down and we are running from God because somehow we tend, to, we tend to think that God is some great evil person and if he catches us, he's going to damn us to hell. And God is, and so God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to dwell among us. But before that, before we get to Christ coming in the flesh, God says, I'm going to give them a sanctuary in Old Testament times, in Moses' time. He said to Moses, build me a sanctuary that I may dwell among you. Because God wants to dwell with his people. God wants to be with us. He wants to be next to us. And so he built a sanctuary from the blueprint that he gave to Moses. And the sanctuary was for the presence of God in the form of what is termed the Shekinah glory. The book of Psalms says that him that dwell between the cherubims shine forth. That shining light which has no earthly source of power was the presence of God itself. So one of the main reasons why God wanted to build a sanctuary in the Old Testament time and to have the whole sanctuary system. Yes, we know it was an object lesson about showing Christ the lamb that's going to come and die for the sins of the people. And they should appreciate that when they had to take their best lamb and cut it short and put it on the altar of the burnt offering and take the blood by the priest into the sanctuary and to sprinkle it on the veil and on the horns of the, the different instruments, furnitures that is in the sanctuary. But also God wanted to be very much present when the high priest went into the most holy place. The Ark of the Covenant had the Shekinah glory, and that was the presence of God. And it goes on, you know, Sister Anik, when they had the Ark in times of war, and when in Eli time, and they realized that the Ark of the Covenant was stolen, and so on and so forth, and they lost the battle because God's presence was gone from them. And so God wants to be among his people, and, and that's one of the reasons why he put the sanctuary service and the sanctuary whole system into play, so that he could dwell among his people. So Elder Vaughn would have done a... A terrific job there, Sister Annie. You know, I, I just want to simply add that God can't keep away from us. <laughs> Sister Annie, you know, sometimes when you're growing up, your, your parents will say, keep away from bad company. <laughs> yes, you know, yes. and, and he must say, I want you from that person and stuff like that. Man fell from grace, Sister Annie, but God can't keep away from us. I just want us to understand the emphasis what Elder Vaughn would have shared, that God is not the one that is, you know, sometimes we say we have found God as Christians, born again Christians. But the thing about it is that God has found us because we are the ones that have been running from him, Sister Annie. God has always been there. We don't need to search for him. He's right there, Sister Annie. Sometimes some of us, we boot up in God. You hear me? Because he's so close. He's so close, Sister Annie, that we just can't escape him. And it is strange because, you know, when people do you bad things, you want to stay from them. But God loves the crowning act of his creation. And he wants more than ever to be with them. Even when we are sinners, he said, Moses, just build me a sanctuary. Can you imagine that? I am up in heaven, perfect heaven. And he said, just build me. I want to be with my people. I'm longing to be with my people. 
And so God keeps searching. He keeps running after us, Sister Anik. What an amazing love, Elder Stacy and Elder Vaughn. When I think about God's love, the immeasurability of his love, the unfathomable nature of his love, we can just lift our hands and say, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Because as you said, God just can't keep away from us. And when you said that, that sweet me bad, Sister Stacy. God just can't take his hand, can't take his eye off of me, can't take his hand off of me. And that applies to all of us. You know, and you know, when we think about the all-inclusive nature of God's love, the fact that even though we mess up, you know, he's still chasing after us to save us. The Bible says in Luke 5, 32, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. God doesn't wish that any one of us perish, but that all of us be saved. And so when we think about these things, it's worth contemplating upon the love of God because he keeps trying over and over. And I think the crowning moment where we can see God's true intention and desire and mission and purpose to be with us was when he sent his son, Jesus Christ. And so I'm going to ask this final question. What are the ways, Elder Vaughn and then Elder Stacy, that you personally would have experienced God's presence in your life? Thanks for that, Sister Anik. You know, it's, it's, it's no secret now by now that I, I was not always a Christian at, uh, as an adult. But ever since then, there have been times where I can overtly say where God has helped me. I mean, I never thought or imagined to stand in front of any congregation and preach the word of God or to stand out on the corner of the street or under a tent or in any other forum to speak on God's behalf or to proclaim the gospel. And, you know, at times I can remember the very first time I would have done so, or even to teach a, a lesson study in, in a setting on a Sabbath morning. My knees buckled. I was like, biting the proverbial fingernails, as they say, and just praying to God asking him for guidance, asking him to calm my spirit. I said, well, hey, this thing actually works. I mean, God actually answers prayers. And in vast, vast more situations in my vocation, at my workplace, etc., where from time to time things happen and continuing to pray and asking God for guidance to help me to overcome uh, the challenges that I face in terms of finishing a project or a report or having some something to give to to my superiors or what have you, God comes through in different ways. Sometimes, you know, he doesn't come through according to my understanding on time, you know, and you go to the boss or whoever and you have to eat your words and humble yourself. But then God comes through maybe a day after in some other way that erases what would have taken place the day before and just brings everything out back into balance. And I said to myself, God, huh? How you do that? I mean, foolish question, but how, how you do that? I mean, I thought everything was dead and done, but you, you, you did this and it's a marvelous thing how God works. God has a mind that only God has. And I can never understand fully how God does things or even understand partially how God does things. But God does things in my life, in my professional work life, at home, at church, all the time, where sometimes I get a little despondent, but then I have to then eat my words and say, God, you, do it, you did it the way you, you could best. I mean, sometimes it's six months after. Sometimes it's a year after. And I said, you know what? When God didn't or did do that that way, he was right. And I just have to say praise the Lord. One of the things I want to encourage everyone who is listening here this morning, it's a good feeling when you say, let go and let God. You say it, but when you experience it, it's a different thing, Sister Anique. And I say, in all facets of my life, I have watched God. I have literally watched him, Sister Annie, do his stuff. Before I was even baptized in the Adventist church some years ago, I had this revelation of some sort that I was given a task to do. And I said, you know, I am not fit to do this task. I don't know. I was in some sort of communication. And I said, no, I cannot. But this was, I think it was my call. And that is why I was given the gift of talk, Sister Anik, because God wanted to use me somehow. I even remember when I had my first crusade, my first and only crusade, Sister Anik. I was there planning this crusade, all excited that the elders were saying to me, it's your turn. It's your turn. And you know, I like to talk, Sister Anik. So I said, okay, it's talking so I can definitely do this. And I sat and I wrote the sermon, Sister Annie, for the whole week. You know what God did to me? 
he said to me, this is not your, your battle. Uh, you are just being the vessel. So you mm -hmm. sat and wrote all those sermons. You're going to squash all those sermons. And every afternoon, every afternoon before the sermon to preach the night, the spirit sat me down and rewrote all the sermons every single day until the crusade was finished. I'm saying to you, God is a powerful God. And, I, and I'm not just talking because many persons may not get an opportunity to go and preach in an evangelistic series, Sister Annie. So I am not looking at this as, but I'm just saying that God will have his way once we allow him in our lives to have his way and he will work powerfully so if you want to see god and if you want to experience god let go and let god have his way in your lives and i challenge each one of us and it will be the best experience that you'll ever have and you'll ever encounter sister and, and you'll want to do it some more amen amen and you know one thing i love about being a part of the whispering hope family in this capacity is the ability that we all have to share of our own personal experiences with God, with others. We don't know how far reaching our experiences will affect the persons who engage on this uh, platform. And so even as I listen to you and Elder Vaughn, I was here saying, do I have the courage to say what I, I have to say now? Because for me, I mean, I have countless experiences where I would have experienced God's presence. But this one to me is one of the, the most impacting ones in 2014 six years into my christian experience so i had been a christian for six years already i became pregnant and i was a teacher at our local sda school i was the head superintendent and personal mil ministry secretary in my local church and suffice to say i was a leader i was a leader in god's church in his school and i was a christian for six years so i wasn't a new fresh christian but for, the grace, but for the grace of God, God allowed me to have this rude awakening to understand where I, Anique, was in my Christian experience. Because if I did not become pregnant, Elder Stacey and Elder Vaughan, God knows I probably would have continued in that illicit relationship that I was in. And so as soon as I found out I was pregnant and I realized, hey, this is where I am, that relationship was ended immediate, almost immediately. But because of God's grace and his presence in my life, I was able to understand who he was and who I was. I saw God's immeasurable love, his unconditional love, his favor still running and chasing after me. Because, I mean, there were countless negative experiences throughout my that particular experience where I would have felt down and felt like letting go. And, of course, my support structure was very important, but more so... When I reflect, my decision where I would have gone contrary to God's will wasn't because I didn't love God at all, but it was a situation where I, I was unfaithful. And even in my unfaithfulness, God decided to still bless me because I have one of the most amazing little girls ever. And so it was through my lowest experience, elders, in my life that would have served as a catalyst and propelled me to where I am today. I am a stronger Christian in Christ, more faith, more boldness to let people know, hey, you think you have, I might not have gotten into other things that some people will, would have gotten into, but this was my experience. You can go as far and as low as to the ground, to the guttermost, and God is going to come there in, with love, gently beckoning you to come back once we confess to him. And so God has taken me through that experience to know that, I'm even doing more for Christ now than I did then. I, I truly, I think I'm in a better position to understand who I am and who God is, the God that I serve. And so when I go out to do ministry with people, because I'm a teacher and I talk to my young people, I can talk from a place now of experience and share, hey, this world doesn't have anything to offer you, you know, young people, because the young man or the young woman will try and fool you or they will make it look like if, you know, make it look as if things are green on the other side and nothing at all goes oh. So we have to stay close to Christ because from the one time we look off, we find ourselves on a downward spiral going further and further and further away from him. So we have to stay close. And so it is through my experience and through, you know, the ability for me to 
overcome and to allow Christ to have his will in my life and to go through and to learn my lesson and to accept God's grace that I am able to now encourage some other young person, some other person who may have a similar experience. So we go through our trials, we go through our experiences, not, not in vain, but to be a teaching and learning experience to help others. And all of this is all ministry. So God is present. When we, the Bible says, listen, David said, listen, if I make my bed in hell, God, hell, God is there. God is with us in every situation. And so we just need to stay close to him because most of the times we're the ones who move away from God. God hasn't moved one iota. We are the ones who move away. God wants to be with us, Whispering Hope family. God wants to be with us, Elder Vaughn, Elder Stacy. He longs to be with us. And as we would have seen through the ceaseless ages of eternity from the Old Testament to the New, God has always been chasing after us. So I pray it is our heart's desire to keep close to him because he's, the, he's not the one who's moving and, and not even Satan himself can pluck us out of his hands. So let us remain grounded and stay connected to Christ. And so as we wrap up, I'm going to ask you, Elder Vaughn, what is your takeaway from today's lesson? Thanks for that, Sister Annie. Thanks for your personal testimony. Indeed, profound and touching. Today's takeaway, as we look at this new quarter's study in the lesson for this quarter, God wants to be with us. And it's a great thing to know that God wants to be with us. Because some of us may be strung out on the fact that we are all alone or nobody loves me or nobody cares about me or my personal close friends have betrayed me uh, it's best i just be by myself keep to myself and just don't have any close associates but god wants to be with all of us in a very personal tangible way and hey look the best friend to have the best person to be your best friend is god almighty there can be no greater and so that should bring comfort and much of calm to all of us to understand that God wants to be with us. If we allow him to be, we'll have the best friend there ever is. I really like the caption for today. God, the God who longs to be with us. And, and I don't think Elder Vaughn, yourself and I can emphasize how much really, 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 really God wants to be with us. As I said before, God is so close to us. So some of us boot up on him and we still run in. You know, and he keeps chasing because he knows he wants to save us and put us back into that perfect place that he would have designed for us. And so I encourage all of us to understand and to take hold and to say, Lord, here I am. I'm ready to be saved. And so this is my encouragement for all of us today. Let's stop running and let's give God what he's desirous to do for us. And that is to save us from our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness so that we can be with him for eternity. Yes, thank you so much, Elder Stacy and Elder Vaughn, for sharing with us and discussing this very important topic about the God that we serve. And we looked at the God who longs to be with us today. And we really had, I think, a really deep and real and authentic discussion. And I think most persons appreciate realness and authenticity. And, you know, I'm happy that you are here with us week after week on Whispering Hope. And I'm thankful that you would have shared your takeaway. For me, my takeaway is simply this. God's message is for us to come unto him. He's there with his hands wide open and he beckons to us to come unto him. And the hymn in our hymn book, 373, Seeking the Lost, comes to mind. Seeking the lost, yes, kindly entreating, wanderers on the mountain astray. Come unto me, his message repeating, words of the master speaking today. Wherever you are, Whispering Hope family, today with Christ. Be reminded that Christ is beckoning each of us to come unto him. And if we come to him, he will give us the desires of our heart. So Elder Vaughan, before we go today, tell us what's coming up next in terms of the topic for IBV into the Bible verse for today. Sister Anik, well, you know, there are alarms that are put in place, alarm systems for maybe a nation or a city, maybe sirens for missiles that are coming or for a fire of some sort. But sometimes, Sister Anik, there could be a false alarm. And the false alarm can cause a lot of havoc and a lot of distress. But coming up on into the Bible verse, right after our study today, we'll be talking about an alarm that one day will not be false. And we're going to see what happens then. So I ask everyone to tune in to Into the Bible Verse on my channel, Victory in Jesus. And you will learn this morning as to 
what happens when there is no false alarm, but the alarm is actually a true one. Thank you so much. I pray that as we go through the rest of today, Monday, and the balance of the week, that we will allow the Spirit of Christ to lead us and to comfort us and uh, help us to live for him and to be faithful in all that we say and we do. May God continue to bless us, all of us, throughout the rest of the day. We spring hope. Come back tomorrow morning. Join us as we study Tuesday's lesson, The God Who Became One With Us. And I encourage you to continue to like the videos, share them, and to subscribe to our channel so that you can be notified of every new thing that happens on Whispering Hope. God bless you, and I'll see you next week, same place, same time.